Hello, everyone. <laughs> Nick, is it is it better? Welcome to uh, uh, the AA lunchtime uh, lecture uh, with Tatiana and Bilbao. We uh, are going to experience quite a, uh, an interesting series of uh, collaborative works. And uh, what is uh, always amazing in uh, looking at Tatiana's work is how she always manages to be extremely uh, focused on uh, reorganizing what the role of architecture uh, can be vis-a-vis -vis, uh, operating in very difficult and sometimes extreme contexts, both uh, in terms of quality, uh, like in her uh, amazing uh, collaborations with uh, some of the most uh, prominent contemporary artists in the world, or in uh, extreme conditions uh, like uh, in uh, social contexts uh, with her work in uh, Mexico. Uh, Tatiana uh, is uh, uh, an architect based in uh, Mexico City, and while operating in those, uh, probably one of the most incredible urban uh, structures in the world, has managed in the last years to uh, exploit that huge uh, transformation that globalization has brought through to reorganize not only her own practice, but the way that her practice relates to other practices around uh, the city and the world. She has formed her office in 2004 and at the same time has uh, engaged with a number of other extremely young uh, and interesting and upcoming architects. Uh, she has formed uh, an interdisciplinary uh, think tank on the city called MXDF, uh, which stands for uh, Mexico City Distrito Federal, uh, which looks at the transformations of uh, the uh, city of Mexico. Together with uh, uh, Michel Roik and uh, uh, Derek Delekamp and uh, Arturo Ortiz, she has started uh, this incredible civic uh, initiative while at the same time establishing her uh, profile as an international uh, architect. And today I think we will see an incredible uh, series of projects that always try to reorganize what architecture could be. Uh, in the face of uh, the incredible power of contemporary art or in the face of uh, extreme urban condition. Please uh, uh, join me in welcoming uh, Tatiana Bilbao to the AM. Thank you, John. Thank you for inviting me here and so please. I'm very happy to be here with you and be being able to share my work with you. It's, it's an honor for me. Thank you very much for being here. And um, first of all, I thought uh, it was going to be interesting if I could put you in context on what our practice is. First of all, uh, since we have projects in many places and we are building a network all over, it, it involves a lot of traveling. We travel uh, more than 100,000 kilometers. Uh, we're based in Mexico City. And I also thought it was important for you to understand a little bit about my, where we are based. Uh, this is uh, Mexico City. The, the white line is uh, the political limit of it. The city extends more to the north. We're 22 million people, more or less. And compared to London in extension, we're probably the same size. Uh, we are a little bit more crowded. The shape of the city looks a lot, well, doesn't look at all like London, but in average, the height uh, of the buildings is three, two to three floors, so it's like London. There are areas, of course, in the center or the new developments where um, uh, buildings, tall buildings are appearing, but not many. So this is uh, a view from the city. It's huge, it's very extensive, as such as London. It's in the middle of a valley. The city has arrived all the way to the mountains. Um, it has grown till it is allowed, definitely. Uh, I, I was always very interested on the urban development of my city, and this is why I founded probably this think tank on the city. Um, I think that urbanism in Mexico is about, uh, it's responsive urbanism, this is what I call it. This is an illegal settlement. Now it's legal, but it, it, it started being illegal. And people arrived there and started living this way, although it looks very planned. It's nothing about planning. 
it, uh, it, 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 people are wiser, started living in this agricultural land, and this is why the shape of the lot looks this long, because the agricultural lots were divided like this. People started uh, to buy these lands, which of course they were not legally sold and legally bought. And afterwards then the city arrives and then it starts putting infrastructure and gives transport to these places and, and the streets and, um, and all the services that are needed. So um, this is how the city grows. It, it, it grows illegally, it, goes, it grows legally as well, but with not many rules and not very planned. So I was telling you it arrives all the way to the top of the mountains, not to the top because then it's hard to build up there, but as, as long as it is easy to build, it will arrive there. Um, then uh, I also think that Mexico City is very green. This is a, uh, an impressive characteristic. You would think that the city is huge and gray and, uh, and, and very polluted. It is polluted and it's huge, but it's green. Uh, in the 50s, around the 50s, 40s, 50s, there was a policy of planting trees all over the city, and now it really it glows. Uh, summer, spring is really beautiful. Now, now we will have all these purple trees blooming, and this makes the city really enjoyable. So it's hard to feel that you live in a 22 million people city, but you do, and uh, it's very crowded. This is a historic center. It's uh, a done. Um, in the pre, uh, when the Spaniards conquered Mexico, and it's built on top of the pre-Hispanic city. And uh, this is a university campus where 300,000 students study. Um, this is part of the new development area where a lot of buildings, new developments have been developed. Uh, how uh, the rich are climbing up also to the mountains doing houses like this to have a flat garden, or more creative houses like this to, to have a flat house. Um, of course, also how the poor are uh, arriving to these uh, hills. And we have many, many slums that have been, um, that government is trying to solve with this, which I think that these people live better than this anyway. Um, and so this is the city where we live, and I, for me it's very important. We have the office in Reforma, which is the most centrally uh, important street of all, and for me it was very important to have it there because I think that the relationship with the city in our practice is, is one of the most important things now that we are trying to to really do these inserts in public life and in um, in changing the quality of life through the public spaces that can make uh, an impact through uh, fixing or trying to fix urban situations and social tissue uh, with these urban insertions, kind of what is so-called uh, acupuncture architecture. No? Uh, we're 32 people in the office and I'm gonna speak in plural always the first question when I, we, we open the questions is why you're speaking in plural is because we're 32 people and without them this wouldn't be what it is. Um, we, uh, ha we're doing many very varied range of, range of projects as John said. We're doing a funeral house and a botanical garden and many things that go in between. You can think about life and death. This is the hall for the funeral house. We did a pavilion in China. We did a small uh, studio for an artist. We are doing a house uh, also in China, a house in Monterey. Same dimensions, different setting. We are doing a community center in, uh, in a park. We're also designing the park, a sports park in a, one of the most uh, dangerous cities in Mexico or maybe in the world, which is Ciudad Juarez. And this is a key project because this comes after we were really trying to do these little insertions in places where um, a park or a community center could really change part of a, a da very damaged society. And it came, came to the office, well, I don't know if by chance or because we, we are really trying to do this. And we are... Um, redoing this three hectares park in, in Ciudad Juarez that will change, or we hope it change, 
the surroundings of it. This is a community center. It's a sports park that has a football field and has this community center with many activities. This is a spectacle center in a total different context. This is um, a city with the, they're not the problems that Ciudad Juarez, Ciudad Juarez has these problems on drug dealing and crime, very high crime. This city is, uh, is uh, well, actually it's a little town uh, in, the, in the state of Guanajuato, and this is a spectacle center that we also try to integrate to the city instead of closing it to, the, to itself. We wanted, we wanted to open it to the, to the public plaza that is created around. And um, we are also working, as John said, with uh, like uh, this a very small structure with a in a collaboration with the artist Gabriel Orozco, who is one of the most important contemporary Mexican artists. We d collaborated with him to do this house in the Pacific Ocean. So we really do a very wide range of projects. And but this has allowed us to understand how we want to proceed during architecture. And one of the main things that I have understood in, in this thing is that uh, architecture needs to be, nowadays for me, for my practice, very collaborative, very multidisciplinary, multicultural. I think the society now is that, is multicultural, is very complex. And to respond for a society that we're living in, we need to be like that. We need to have many heads that are thinking on one uh, on one issue, and so this is why I think we have been uh, able to share and to bring in to the project to the different inputs from different disciplines and different countries uh, to build these little insertions. The first project that I'm going to show today, I'm going to show two. It's a project. Uh, it's a pilgrimage route in the state of Jalisco, which is north of the of Mexico City. This is. Uh, the, the white dot is Mexico City, and the black line you see is the, where the route is. It goes, it's 154 kilometers long, and it's a pilgrimage route that it's been going, this pilgrimage has been going on for almost 300 years. And it's a pilgrimage from uh, Ameca, an area around Ameca, a little town called Ameca, to Talpa. Talpa is uh, where a virgin is, and people go there to pray, for to, to give thanks or to pray for this burden. So um, the root is, uh, the origin is in, in your right, and the destiny is here in the, in the left. The altitude changes a lot. The uh, 1,900 1, meters above sea level is the highest point it arrives, but it goes up and down. It makes it hard to to do it, but people do it uh, in four days, more or less. Uh, this is a tradition that it's really important for these people, and it's very deep. Um, they, they really spend the whole year planning to go there during Easter time, mainly. And the governor from this state asked the Minister of Tourism to to try to think how to transform this route into a more touristic one or into a one that is used whole year around, probably. Not only during this Holy Week, with Easter week, which is um, in now in, in April, it's going to be this year, and where three million people walk at the same time. So um, also for this week, uh, infrastructure is n was non-existent before. Uh, of course, the, these were the only little infrastructure that existed, very informally done. This is a, a place to eat and some uh, toilets. These are places where they put their wishes on where, what, why they're going to do this walk, uh, why, what's the commitment they're going to do in order to do this walk. Of course, along the walk, there are also tombs like this one. The, the landscape is very, very varied. It goes um, from very dry areas to uh, open, uh, f uh, then to forests, uh, then more humid. And so the, the route encounters several, several types of images all the time or of, of landscapes. Uh, ima when you imagine three million people walking at the same time period of the year without any infrastructure, you, of course, uh, 
can find these things, and it's obvious because there's nowhere to throw trash away, nowhere to do um, to go to the toilet, to rest probably. So they start doing this informal, very informal structures uh, to to have all these services. So we, I was asked to 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 do a master plan and to to start uh, locating the, the places where we would do services, where we would do food toilets, resting areas, uh, workshop areas, uh, viewing points, uh, to, to help with the signature, with the signage, with the um, trash, of course, handling the trash and the landscape. Uh, so I thought that the good idea to do it, this is the route that goes along, that the good idea was to invite Derek Delekan, a very close friend, and another architect with his own practice, to uh, together decide on the master plan and to make a team inviting architects from different places to do these different structures. We convinced the government, the government that this would be a great idea to insert um, pieces of people that have no contact at all with this context and pieces of people that are totally immersed in this context, local architects on, and people working for them. So we did the master plan and we decided where we would have medical service, sanitary service, toilets, uh, trash containers, um, as areas for, for food and rest, and uh, areas for water, and we invited um, Weiwei from China. We invited Kristen Gantenbey and HHF from Basel. We invited uh, Alejandro Aravena from Chile. And we invited also uh, a different number of Mexican architects um, and, uh, and specialists in uh, field, fields operations, which could allow us to make this project very uh, varied, very complex, but also I think very rich in ideas, no? Uh, we invited all, the, we went to the visit, and everybody chose their spots. Of course, we, before we did the master plans I show you, and uh, each of the architects, the different architects, did the little different structures. We wanted like the areas of, of, of um, supplies, where water supply is, where toilets, where uh, the, the, the rest places would be done by local people because we thought this, really these places needed to be um, very related to the site. So we, were, we thought that it was difficult to hire a Swiss architect to do all these uh, water supply areas. So these ones, we, we thought the Mexican local architects were going to build it. And I think that was a very successful combination uh, the, the construction of all these little structures that I'm now I'm going to show, it's going on, it's almost done, and it's going to be done for this pilgrimage of this year in April. So the first structure in the, um, in the root, which is in the beginning, in the, in the origin, in the, in the right, it's, um, it needed to be uh, an ad identification place, it needed to be uh, an icon that could be seen from many places that could mark a start point and could also mark a reference for the starting uh, of the pilgrims. And so we, this one we decided to do it, Derek and myself together, and, um, and we decided to start with the, with the most important symbol of Catholicism. Sorry, I didn't tell you before that the, the, the pilgrimage is Catholic. 95% of the population in Mexico is Catholic. So, and they're very, very devoted to a lot of virgins, and this is one of the virgins that are there, the devoted, Talpa. So we decided to start with the most important symbol of Catholicism, which is a cross. And we did um, four walls defining the cross as an open chapel. And um, to make it identifiable, to make it um, also a place where you could uh, rest a little bit, have a little bit of shadow. The, uh, we orientated the, um, the cross in order to have more sun in the peak hours of the day. So people can also, while well, they're probably or praying or just waiting for their, for their family and friends to be uh, in, a, like in a kind of open shelter, 
We also thought that doing these walls, we could also help them have a wall where they can put these um, signs with their, commi their commitments, all the, all the lines that they will, they're um, grateful for and why they're doing this uh, pilgrimage. Um, we also, um, the, the very interesting part is that all of these spots are very remote. So they're, they're, lo they're locally built. The people that it's building this is hired from this little town. And of course, they have no idea on, on managing m many things, many materials. But they've, uh, they've been directed by the people from the government. And I think it's very becoming very successful, the, the results, because the handcraft is beautiful and it's uh, very well done. The quality of the buildings are becoming very impressive. This is the second point, and it's an observatory area done by Chris and Gantemain, a Swiss architect from Basel. And uh, you can, from here, you are going to be able to see this one. And from there, you're going to be able to see the other one. And from there, you're going to be able to see the next one. So this is part of starting the identification of the route. Of course, we never did a, 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 a route. We are not marking the place where the where the people will walk, because this is the challenge exactly. The people don't like, don't want to have this, this route marked. Everybody goes somewhere. But then all along, there are key points where this is marked. Um, so this is an observatory point where also all sort of things can be placed in this, in this column. And it has an interior space, which also can be a workshop space. This is a piece by Weiwei. Uh, Wei was a uh, Chinese artist who invited us to the two Chinese projects that we did. So we thought we can give him back the invitation, but also think it's a great artist. So he's an artist, architect, um, in between these things. And um, he, he did this wall, it's a Chinese wall. <laughs> and uh, the wall goes, um, it's very, uh, I think it's very spiritual place because the wall goes up all the way to the sky and it goes down the other side all the way down to the earth. The pilgrimage, the pilgrims will cross this line mostly all the time like this and uh, this is where they arrive, they can walk up or down the, the wall. This is um, not very recent images but the, it's almost finished by this time. This is also um, a workshop place we did. Um, and uh, this is, we did it in the office. It's two walls that are folding into each other. And what they do is they, they become a, a bench at the beginning, then a shadow, and then a, a, a workshop place, again a shadow, and again a bench for the pilgrims. Thank you. Ah, thank you. This is great. Uh, we, we are doing this in compacted earth because we thought, well, first of all, the earth in this area where we are working on it's beautiful, the color is really nice. Uh, secondly, because uh, it's an easy w um, construction method that people around here use. This is not as simple a structure as they are used to, but we think that with the government builders, we, w we were ever able to gonna do it. So this is the bench in the beginning, then there's the shadow, then it's the workshop place, and then again. All the... Um, um, shelters are done uh, for, for night rest, are done in, um, in a very local way of building, but of course different shapes and different uh, way of using the same material. These are done by local architects and uh, these are different all over from one to each other. There are eight of them and they're shelters for passing the night uh, and, uh, and to keep away from the weather, from the circumstances of the weather, rest a little bit and go again. This is uh, an observatory point, the next observatory point that it's seen from the one that I showed you before of Chris and Gantenbein, and this is from HHF. It's also a Swiss firm uh, based in Basel also. We think that this piece is gonna be very well um, received for by the pilgrims because it's very playful. We, we already have had uh, many, many comments of the people that are around of it and that, the, um, that they like it and they, it's a, a viewing point and it's um, a platform and it's a, a little bit playful 
and, and, and nice with the, with the surrounding. This is um, also old pictures, but it's almost done. Um, this is a, a, another viewing platform from uh, Elemental, from Alejandro Aravena. And um, his idea was to, to create this tension between the root and the, and the view. And I think he, he managed to do it very correctly in the way this is, uh, this is finished. And this is also seen from, here you can see the other little HHF viewing point. And from HHF you can see this one, barely. Uh, this one's, these structures are smaller, so it's harder to see them. But we were asked also uh, to always to refer to these uh, religious icons. And this is the Virgin of Talpa, where they go at the end. And Alejandro Aravena thought uh, he, he put it like this in the rooftop so it could create a shadow during all, most part of the day in the interior space. This is the last uh, structure that the pickle, pilgrims would pass by, uh, except for the services areas. It's also a worship area, and it's, um, it's done by Derek Delecamp. And it's only uh, a circle that uh, encompasses the, the landscape and also lifts yourself to, to, to think uh, to, to a spiritual place, I think. And uh, it, 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 it is in the middle of a forest. You can go in, and then there's, little, there's gonna be little benches there to sit and to rest and to worship thoroughly. This is uh, being under construction. It's almost done. This was not an easy structure, of course. It's 40 meters in diameter, but, uh, but it's there, and I think it's one of the most poetic ones. So this is the Virgin of Talpa, where they go to pray to. And this is the, the church. The church has no, not much architectural interest. Uh, it, 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 it was rebuilt in 1940s, and the, of course the structure is not that interesting. So that project um, bring uh, all these things together, and I think that the, um, what we are returning back to, to the place is that it's a, it, it now has much more infrastructure, but it has infrastructure, recognizable infrastructure, which I, which I think that a, for a route, a cultural or religious route, it's very important, you know? And it, it's going to give definitely a different force to it and a different, um, and a different attitude from the people to it. So uh, let's see, we'll, we will see the first pilgrimage this year and we'll see how the results are. This, the, this second project that I'm going to show, and the last one, is um, a project in, uh, in Culiacán. And this project is probably the most important project that the office has had for many reasons. I think the first reason is because uh, there are not many projects in Mexico done this way. First of all, it's a, pr a public place. It's a, it's a public garden. And, uh, and the, our client and the one that is putting the money is a private, private businessman. And he is donating all this money to build this park. And this doesn't happen in Mexico at all. Like this kind of project and this kind of collaboration between public and private in this very direct way. It's very hard to find. And I think it's it definitely an example. This is a bus very important businessman from from this city in the north of Mexico, and he um, he really wants to to transform the idea of uh, of the the whole country that they have for this city. This city is Culiacán, is the capital of a state named Sinaloa. Sinaloa is one of the most important agricultural states in the whole country. And recently, it has become also one of the most important agriculture states in the country, but not exactly for good agriculture, for bad agriculture. Uh, there, were, there are, of course, um, a very important point for drug selling, for drug um, growing and selling. And uh, m one of the most important drug cartels is from Culiacán, the Cartel de Sinaloa, which is one of the most uh, dangerous and criminal of them. So this city is known in the mind of everybody, especially in Mexico, in the country, uh, as being this drug capital. So this businessman that has been, that was born there and that is this his city, and of course has done his big business from there, wants to give this city back something different and wants to give a new face to it. 
Um, the second important thing is that when we started doing this project, I always had this idea about architecture being multidisciplinary and working with many people uh, and involving, trying to involve in different projects many different um, uh, disciplines as I could. Uh, but I couldn't do it until this one arrived to the office, really. Because in this project, it's naturally that we all have to collaborate. We need, uh, uh, we need to be involved with politics, definitely. So we need to, be, to have politicians in the team. We need to have philosophers, economists, botanics, landscape architects, the graphic designer, and industrial designer. And I'm going to explain more why, because how is, why is this complex? But I think this has defined the way the practice goes. We, of course, it was our interest, but this project allows to really make it happen and from then on with other projects. Uh, this is Culiacán, where Culiacán is. is in the north of the country, northwest, and it's, um, it's 80 kilometers more or less from the, from the shore, from the Pacific Ocean. Uh, Culiacán is uh, a city of one million people and it's, uh, it has two rivers uh, that are passing through. This is the most important part of the city and here is the botanical garden and, uh, and an ecological park that we are starting to plan. Uh, so here are the two uh, rivers. This is the botanical garden. This is the city center. The city is very flat. It's two floors high, the whole city. Probably the highest building is six floors and it's one. And, um, and also, it, the project is very, very important because from that project, we're able to develop five more others in this city. And now we think that we are really, with this, trying um, to, to make an insertion, an important insertion in the urban tissue of this city. And, um, and we, of course, were very lucky to get them through the commission of the Botanical Garden, where we met different political important people in the city and this is how we started to get these commissions. This is um, a, a biotechnological park which is here and it's um, a public building for a private institution. Uh, the institution is a uh, university, one of the most important universities in Mexico, in the whole country. It's a private uh, um, institute, uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey, and they're doing this building to relate the academic part that they, they control with the, with, the, with the city, with the businesses. And this is a public building where cultural events in the auditorium will, will pass and also uh, public events that will happen and also um, businesses renting spaces to uh, probably lab spaces to hire students and start doing some research. So this building would be an icon building for the, for the campus, but also would be a public building start, starting to share this relationship between academics and business. Uh, the next project we're doing is a, is a pathway in, this, in the center of the city. We convinced the governor to do, um, he, we were asked to do a monument for the bicentenary, which is now uh, very popular in Mexico. It, this year is the 200 um, years of, we're celebrating 200 years of independence in Mexico and revolution, 100 years of revolution. And all the governors are willing to do a monument in different places and, uh, and to celebrate with monuments, with building strange things you know, in the cities, in different cities. So we were asked on that and we, they, the governor wanted us to do um, an arch in an entrance of the city. And we said that that was probably not a good idea that because that would not give anything to the city. We convinced him that we had to intervene the area of the river because the river is kind of left behind. People don't leave the river, don't go there, don't, don't, don't look at it. Even all these um, houses try to give the back to the river, which is a beautiful one and it's a beautiful area. So we convinced them to bring the people to the river during three, the, doing this pathway, connecting the island, and really bringing them, the people on top of the river. And then, of course, we added the, the reason why is a monument of the Bicentenary, which is these 200 poles that each represent a year uh, of independent Mexico, and it's also sustainable. 
because it looks into the future, so all these poles are lit not by a windmill that, it's, that we're gonna set up here, and uh, so it, it doesn't need any energy from the city, consume any energy from the city, or any water or anything, it's going to be totally sustainable. The, um, the other project that we're doing is uh, an annex building, this building on top, this is the one that we're doing for a cultural institute in, in Culiacán. They needed more space, but also they needed to regenerate their public space because they couldn't use it. The weather is really extreme, so we created shadow areas for, the, uh, for spaces that could be used more uh, intensively during the day than they're used now. And this is the botanical garden. This is the botanical garden, the ecological park. And when we arrived, the botanical garden existed. And um, for me, the most important thing uh, of the botanical garden was the, the way it was done. It was done in a very spontaneous way. Uh, the, you never felt overwhelmed by it in Mexico. Um, culture is for a very reduced elite, and people, when they go into museums, probably they don't go into museums, even th if they're free, because they would feel very overwhelmed. They feel that they would not belong there. They would feel that they really should know about it, and they don't know, so they really neglect, neglect themselves from going. And this is what I thought that I was going to feel in this botanical garden when I arrived, because the truth is that I had no idea on botanics before this, before this commission. So I thought I was going to arrive there and I was going to feel really bad because I should know all these species and botanic issues and I didn't know anything. But in the contrary, I felt really welcome and um, the, the visit was very pleasing. So this is the the first thing I wanted to, to keep, definitely, you know, that the place, you could feel that they, there was a huge uh, range of plants and very specialized and very special and uh, all classified, but, but also you feel very welcome, very, uh, that you could really get into it without feeling that you don't know anything. Uh, the good thing is that the botanical garden, and I think it's because of that, is used for many, many things. Uh, kids, uh, the, the people going to r just rest, the quinceañeras, which is um, a very traditional uh, spec uh, fest in Mexico. When you when you are 15 years old, you have this big party, especially when you're a woman, and uh, people go to the botanical garden to take their pictures of this day where they are giving, throwing this party away. And uh, so the botanical garden is really used. Then they film, uh, uh, this is uh, an ad for a television ad. Uh, school tours are always there. So the, um, we wanted to keep that use. The idea of the, um, of the client, the first, uh, how everything started is because he's an art collector. He has one of the most important contemporary art collections in Mexico, and he wanted to donate 35 pieces of art to the garden. And then he invited a friend and a curator that decided and convinced him to not donate 35 pieces of his collection, but to commission 35 artists to each do a, a single piece type specific for the, for the garden. And then, uh, of course, they, they realized that if they're going they, they were going to be this ambitious of inviting 35 artists each to do a different piece. They should need different things, of course, uh, starting from a master plan. You know? um, so this is the garden when we found it. And uh, we thought that the best idea to start was to have a regulation plan or something. We call it a regulation plan, a master plan. and. Um, when I arrived, they only asked me to do some extra buildings that they needed, they thought they needed for the, for the garden, such as an auditorium, um, uh, a cafeteria, a library, this kind of structure that would give service to the new program in the botanical garden. But I thought that we needed more of a master plan and an organization plan that could really regulate the things that were going to happen in the botanical garden, combining it with the old things. 
So we took a trace of the branches of a, branches of a tree uh, that it was in the botanical garden. We uh, we overlapped it with the when with the master existing master plan. Of course, we had to adapt it. It's a living structure, and we couldn't move. Of course, trees that were there for 50 years. So we had to adapt it, our um, our plan to what it existed, and finally we arrived to this thing. So we inserted um, some structures. Uh, but before we, we finalized with this plan, with this working plan, we thought we needed to invite uh, um, an expert on botanics because the main uh, reason for this garden to exist is botanical garden. So we needed to reinforce the, the, the botanical part. We knew it, we kind of censored it, but then when these people arrived, of course, they thought they needed to reinforce the collection quite a lot. To make it very representative, for example, in the endemic plants of the of the area, and to make it very important in terms of botanical uh, research uh, in the area and also among Mexico, the country. So this involved moving a lot of trees um, and a lot of species from one place to another one, and this has taken a lot of time. It's been going on for almost five, four years now. The project is. Uh, five years old, but the, 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 when we started was four years ago. And we've been reinforcing the collection in a way and working with the landscape that nowadays the garden is again blooming but very differently. We started doing this uh, pedestrian pathway that divides the ecological park, believe me or not, this is named the ecological park, and this is the botanical garden. And uh, this pathway that we did, it was to give an entrance to both and to uh, connect the parking and the different streets uh, around this area. And now it has become a, a very important place in the social context in Culiacán because it comes the gathering place. This is something of uh, different stalls, booth stalls. And then uh, in the afternoons, people go around there to see where who is there and who can meet there, no? We also uh, changed and added five different water pumps. This is the main central one. Um, this is uh, the second one we, 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 in, we, we did. We did it from scratch. We reinforced the collection of, the, uh, of bamboo areas. And, uh, and we created different spaces of new different spaces from rest and all these things. We also are, have been creating uh, different pathways along it and uh, that can take, lead you to different areas or to art pieces. Then uh, combining the art, all the 35 artists went to the botanical garden. They each chose a space and proposed uh, uh, a piece. The artists are artists recognized all over the world, such as Dan Graham, James Durrell, Olafur Eliasson, Ricri Tiramanija, Francis Alice, Simon Starling, uh, Tino Segal, blah, blah, blah. This, the list is huge, it's 35 artists, all of these names are there. And they all went there and we, we collaborated with all of them because of course we had to make it work it out when they are especially uh, choosing these spaces where they do large pieces or large interventions. This is an intervention, this is the intervention from Alor Alcanzadilla, which is a, a human leg that goes out from a tree. This is a Photoshop, it's not yet installed in place, but it's going to be very soon. This is a piece from Abraham Cruz Villeva, a Mexican artist. Alor Alcanzadilla are two artists from uh, the US, from Puerto Rico and US mainland. This is, uh, this is Abraham Cruz Villegas, which is a Mexican artist. This is Dan Graham, which is already is installed in, in place. It's a pavilion done with uh, glass, the same as Dan Graham does in all his work, in using reflection to work with. Um, it's hard to photograph, of course, because it uses reflection, and so that's the main point. This is a pavilion from Olafur Eliasson, which is uh, a very nice pavilion that creates different shadows in the floor. And this is what his main interest was. And it's going to be covered with all these plants at some point during um, some years. 
This is um, a piece from Mario Garcia Torres, which is a cannabis plant, and he wanted to, of course, many of the artists are dealing with the drug problem, which uh, the client didn't want it exactly that, but of course it's happening because all the artists find it very exotic to address the drug culture and the drug fashion and all these things that are happening there. And uh, this artist wanted to plant a cannabis plant in the botanical garden. That was his piece. But of course, he asked for permission, because you need to ask for permission to the government. And the government denied it. So we cannot display a cannabis plant there, marijuana. And uh, so this is uh, an artificial one that it's going to be planted, and it's going to be named, and it's going to say that we could not display the natural one for governmental reasons. Uh, this is a piece from Richard Long, which is an American artist uh, doing very geometrical forms with non-geometrical natural elements, such as the rock. Um, and this piece is also already installed in place and very used. Another very important thing of the curatorial uh, uh, part was that the pieces needed to be part of the garden as the garden was, a very intuitive way in a very simple way so people can relate to art in a very natural way and not feel very overwhelmed by it as well. Um, this is a piece from Teresa Margolles. She is an artist from Culiacán. And she, her, her work deals directly with uh, the drug problem. And these uh, benches, which look very comfortable, they're concrete, they're, they're comfortable. The concrete benches done with the, the water in the concrete has these liquids from the deaf people uh, killed by the drug problem. This is um, a piece by Rivane Neuris van der. This is a Brazilian artist, and this is a piece for kids, so this will be in the educational room for kids. This is a piece from Julian Oppi, a sign piece. You know, Julian Oppi's work is about signs. Mainly, um, this is an identification form, blah, 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 and that's what he did in the botanical garden. This is a piece from Gabriel Orozco, which is a Go game um, in a huge scale, a Chinese game named Go. Uh, this is a piece from uh, Pedro Reyes. Pedro Reyes is also dealing with the drug problem, and he, I think this is a very poetic one. He, um, uh, he asked the military to retrieve all the guns uh, from the drug dealers and to crash them and to melt them into the, the melted steel and make tools, gardening tools for the botanical garden. And we have around 2,000 gardening tools made out of the guns from retrieved from the drug dealers in Culiacán. This is a, a Jorge Pardo piece that uh, it's in um, enclosing the desert area and designing all the desert area. He's very interesting in desert, interested in deserts. This is a piece from a um, uh, Brazilian artist, Valesca Suarez, and it, which is a water pond uh, surrounded by plants. This is almost done. Uh, this is a piece from a Mexican artist, Sofia Tawas. And on and on and on. We have a piece from James Turrell, which is an observatory in this beautiful area that it was there already like that. It's of course not naturally planted, but it was there when James Turrell arrived. And of course, he wanted to use this context to make his observatory work. This is a piece from a Mexican artist named Pablo Vargas Lugo. It's a star coming from the bamboo area. And this is a piece from France West an Austrian art, artist uh, that deals with sculpture, and uh, there are some fountains in the water pond that, that we did. So uh, dealing with all these, we combined the, the artwork with the architecture, with the landscape, and um, we decided to place the different structures in the, of course, the places where they needed to be, the uh, south entrance with all the services, cafeteria, sir, uh, toilets, uh, store, uh, ticket entrance and etc. Then we did a little um, auditorium and now uh, an exhibition room, uh, a pottery room, a pottery workshop, mainly pottery workshop, could be other workshop, uh, a library, uh, a greenhouse, educational facilities for kids, a uh, room for, for workshop for kids, uh, an auditorium, a small auditorium, services, toilet, in the north access which has uh, offices, also a ticket area and, and a little store. And we decided to do all these buildings coming from the trays we did of the branches. So the, the shape, of course, is defined by the program. 
but also by the, the definition that we gave to the master plan. We, uh, in volume, we thought that it was important to, for these buildings to try to relate a bit with the, um, with, the, with the natural context. So we decided to do them in, in a tectonic way, kind of tectonic way. They're all in exposed gray concrete, natural concrete, and they, um, they have these forms trying to relate with nature, probably rocks, and the, our idea would be that the nature would also eat them and plants are starting to grow on top of them. Um, this is uh, the exhibition area, the, um, the workshop and the library. Uh, again, same idea and same decisions, uh, architectonically speaking, about the definition of the materials. Uh, the, of course, the space is defined by the program. This is the exhibition room, the back of the the pottery workshop and the back of the library, the front of the library and the pottery workshop, uh, the exhibition area by night also. This is the pond, the water pond, where the um, Franz West Keys will be installed. This is the educational facilities with the auditorium and the services. Uh, again, the same decision um, in terms of form and, and material. Uh, this is the educational facility, the little auditorium and the, the toilets. This is this a set of buildings is being built uh, as, as we speak. It's going to be done in four months, more or less. Um, the only building that we didn't uh, gave the same material solution was the greenhouse, for obvious reasons, because we needed to give uh, the space a very different um, atmosphere, It'll also create and control temperature and ventilation. So we decided to keep the idea on the shape uh, that comes from the master plan and is defined by the program, but we needed to have a different material definition, so we uh, created this glass uh, pa pavilion facade with a film that uh, that is um, with a film that it's cut in the in the form of the shape of the, the trees that are around, and that allows exactly this amount of sun sun rays that we needed for the special program that is in there. And, um, and the definition of the, of the film is, uh, it was taken because of the temperature control, so the, the, and the, the film is this color, we didn't choose the color, that's the, the film that we needed to control the temperature exactly in the degrees that we were asked for. And, uh, and also the density on how it's cut is more open in the north and south facade and it's more uh, closed and, and almost uh, completely solid in the, in the west and the east facade. Um, the, the whole project, as I was telling you, gives uh, an input to the office that is very different. It's collaborating with art, with landscape, with, uh, of course, with architecture, with the definition of spaces but mainly the definition of a place that will change enormously the way that Culiacán is looked at and the way that people in Culiacán will leave this space. I think that also will change a lot of things. People will be in contact with contemporary art, which at the moment they're not. They're, um, in Culiacán there's probably very few um, examples of art and a very small museum that doesn't have necessary the best exhibitions that are in Mexico. So uh, people will really relate to their city in a very different way. This is an important place, as I told you, it's very used already. And with these addings uh, that it, they have been very well received, we are almost, I think, 40% done through all the project. Uh, it has been very well received. One of the main ideas of the client was to never shut down the garden while the works are done. So people have been doing, have been seeing how this is going, um, going on and how the garden is becoming what it, it's intending to be. And also these are very important things for people to relate to this garden. No? And uh, with this I finish the this presentation and I would like to open for a discussion if there is or questions or if there's time.
Are there any questions? No direct questions. I have a question for uh, you. Ken. The mm, incredible thing about the last project, I think, is uh, the way that you start um, from very practical terms uh, on how to arrange this uh, gift from the client to the city with the master plan. And then you show us almost stubbornly how you bring that through. Uh, and the uh, initial organizational uh, device becomes almost a, a curatorial, device, curatorial device, but also a way of organizing botanics and public space. I wanted to ask you the uh, amount of um, collabor collaborative effort that uh, was put into that master plan that was uh, then carried out so successfully. I wanted to, if you could uh, explain more on that. I have it here. <laughs> so definitely the, the amount of effort was very high. We had to involve many people and when you involve more people, of course, you know, it's uh, the, na the, the amount of discussion becomes much higher. And uh, the, as I told you, we did the initial um, idea of tracing the branches of a tree and overlapping it and adapting it. But we had to involve in the, in the final definition of it to the landscapers, the, the botanical people. Of course, a lot of things were, were defined by the botanical decisions uh, first, and then we had to involve the, the, the artist. Uh, uh, an, an anecdote from the artist and, and the amount of, of this coordination that needed to be done is uh, when, we were, when we took Dan Graham to the Botanical Garden, James Durrell was already there and had already choose the place and have developed the project and we've been working with James for, Durrell for almost uh, two years, I think. And then Dan Graham came to visit the garden, and he was, he's very grumpy. He's, uh, he's always very, uh, very mad and very hectic, and he's scratching his head and walking around. And then he's like, oh, this place is horrible. And like, yeah, he, was, he was really complaining about everything. And then he arrived to, to James Turrell's area, and he said, this is perfect. This is my place. This is where I'm going to be this here. I only can only imagine my piece here. And we were all like, oh my God, what are we going to tell this guy? Because the, it was very hard to convince the client to do a Dan Graham's piece because he was not so interested in Dan Graham, but the curator was very, very interested in Dan Graham. And so we were like, oh, now what are we going to do? Finally, we took him around and he found another spot And because we told him, no, you're going to see. If this is a good place, we're going to show you the best in the botanical garden. So this is the kind of things that we had to deal all the time with 35 artists that they really want their piece there and they want their piece to be like this. The client is a little bit sometimes um, not so, uh, he's not, he doesn't agree with everything. You know? he, he also wants his things done, the, done the, his way. So dealing with the artists, with the landscape designer, with the, um, with the curator, with the, with the client itself, because Agustin is very, very involved in the projects, not that he's letting us do whatever. He's really, uh, the, the meetings with him are review, also rev we need to review with them the, the um, faucets from the toilets, the public toilets. He really is into every detail. So it takes, uh, uh, it takes a lot of time uh, to, to make this, uh, involvement of everybody into one thing, but at the end I think this is a result of this work. Otherwise it couldn't be done in this way. No more questions. So thank you very much, Tatiana. Thank you, John. <laughs>